in the pilot, they have a little bit of a cutaway where they show you on day 13, and then it goes all the way back to day one. So when you read the script and you saw like what would be happening, like what drew you to the role when you read the script? It's just so well written. Every character is so compelling, and I just feel very human, you know? Every character, you know, I could relate to who they were, and I was very interested to see where their paths would go. Who's Lex, and, and, why, and what does he struggle with, and, and his relationship with Jana, and who's this Chris guy, or J uh, Jake, what are his walls, and I felt like every character was so interesting because they're very human, we all have these little walls up, really we all just want to open our heart and love each other, and so I just, I, I loved that it was kind of a discovery of people and their desire to be loved and to love, and what they'll do for the ones they love. And uh, again, like playing a female role that's strong, she's not a victim, even if she's been victimized. And somebody who, who is, I mean, single moms, my gosh, the, you know, they have, they have a heavy low. And so to even just be able to represent a single, a single parent was, was a, so every, I think every character, every character is so compelling and it's just, the arc of the series. I didn't know when I read the pilot that riot scene what was going to happen or what would get us from there. We kind of we learned that throughout the season, which was really exciting. We're like, how are we going to get through this riot? What's going to happen? Uh, so it's just a fun ride for me to see. You know, I, I wanted to know what was next when I read the pilot, and I think I think that's enough to make anybody interested. Yeah, I saw the first two episodes, and after the second episode, I almost cried because I didn't have any more to watch. Oh, good. Yeah, because it's really, it's really good. You start to get invested into the characters immediately, and that's what I really liked about the show is because the character development happens so quickly, but so fluidly and organically that it's not. It's like you're like a, a fly on the wall watching these people go through this ordeal. So it, that's what I really loved about the show. And getting to the end of the second episode, I was like. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Love the show. Thank you. The first two episodes, and I was just telling um, Kristen how sad I was at the second episode ending because right. I didn't have any more to watch. It's one of those shows where we, you get more and more invested because you get more and more invested in these characters, and the virus situation gets more and more harrowing. So you just it draws you in and draws you through it. When we were making it, we get a cut, you know, like episode four. And we're like, oh my god, I gotta see what happens in episode five because it's getting and like, we're still shooting it. <laughs> you know, it really um, is that type of storytelling that just because you're so invested in the characters, you just get invested in the season. Yeah, what is he? So what can what can we look forward to in the upcoming episodes for season one? Like what? Right. Well, as we said on the panel, it's 19 days, um, so we'll go up to and past all the insanity you saw at the beginning of the pilot, um, and it really is um, how this city and how this board is affected by a virus that spreads very rapidly and um, is sort of burning its way through the society. Now, this is based on, it's modeled after actual bio outbreaks, I mean, I think like some other shows, um, you know, it's not a zombie show where people die and stay dead, and it's sort of modeled to a certain extent on an Ebola like pilot. So it reacts in the same ways that something like that would. And we really consulted with a lot of folks at the CDC and infectious disease specialists, and the scary thing was. Whatever we come up with a scenario, was, was this plausible at all? They'd be like, oh no, it'd be much worse. You know? <laughs> uh, they were very concerned, they are very concerned, it's not like this could happen in America. And um, it's sort of like people that work on terrorism, they're like, well, it's sort of inevitable, it's something like this could happen again. These folks are concerned that the viral outbreak, because of, because of the way we travel now, you know, there's so much fluidity between countries, and all it really takes is a single person to carry this in, and then you're, you know, if you're in a particularly dense area, we, we, we would have a big problem. And this kind of situation is very plausible in the sense this just happened in Sierra Leone in 2014, like quarantining a giant part of the neighborhood. With the Ebola so scare. To yeah. think that it, it, it couldn't happen here is a little bit of false optimism. Uh, the more research we did, the more scare we got, but it was good research. And it was actually a really fun process to chart. Um, the neighborhood throughout the season. 
you know, really say, okay, well, how would an, uh, a neighborhood devolve under this circumstance? When would garbage pick up end? When would people stop going outside because they're too scared? When would they run out of food? Yeah. yeah. You know, how many days? Um, so, yeah, it was interesting. Um, what about the, the makeup? And the, the prosthetics yeah. and everything, because right. the way that these people deteriorate so rapidly, because I think they, they said that it was within 48 hours is imminent yeah, death. We so have a phenomenal makeup team. It they looks were, so they real. Were lights out, and they they approached it with a plan. So we essentially knew going, you know, there are essentially five stages more or less to this disease from getting it to death. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could say the makeup department, okay, they're more in stage three now. There's been so, this many hours. And to have that as a reference was really helpful. And they had reference photos yeah. of uh, people that they put in the prosthetics. Okay, that's what stage three is supposed to look like. Their eyes are drawn as they're bleeding a little, you know. And so it was always very regimented. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, there's sort of a, a very codified look. And you almost can tell just by looking at people how sick they are. Um, it, it's intense, but it's, it, was, it was fun to do. So your character, Dr. Cannert, on the show is from the CDC, and he yes. discovers this pathogen, this, this illness, from one of the other doctors who patient zero was in contact with her. What did you do to prepare for this role? Because there's a lot of... There's a lot of, there's especially you see in the pilot, there's a lot of medical terminology I had to study up on. And what is great about this show, I'm sure you've heard from other people, we're trying to make it as real as possible. Something that can actually happen here, the Zika, there's a bird, the West Northern Virus. So you, we talk with the CDC people, we talk, I, I had one-on-ones with the CDC, me and Claudia Black's character, me and Claudia Black, yeah. her character as well. Um, we all had meetings individually, I had a med tech on board, because you'll see later on, I have to do all sorts of little medical techniques, and we don't want people to go, oh, that's not how you do it. We want it to be as real as possible, I want it to be as real as possible for my character. So we have the technician, we have the people there going, this is how you do it. And as well as feeling all these medical terms, you know, encephalopathy, blah, 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 I'm also doing all these things, like hooking up the IVs, doing the, you know, injections, etc. And uh, it's, a, it's a lot of multitasking for a guy, and, and I, can't, I can't handle it. <laughs> it's, it's hard. And, um, well, there's, there's a scene in particular where you are doing the autopsy on patient zero, and there's one scene in particular where something explodes, and I, what was your reaction? Did See, you know it was coming? That wasn't supposed to happen. The explosion was, it was an accident, I just fumbled. I mean, it was, it was a, so we had, I mean, just, just the lengths they go to to make sure it, it looks as real, it feels as real for the audience. The body, I mean, when you see it, and I'm not sure how much you're allowed to show on network television of that, of that cadaver on the body, but being there was amazing. All they didn't have, thank goodness, was the smell. They didn't have that. <laughs> that would have been, I wouldn't be able to do it. And, um, but you're there and you've got the organs, and obviously, George, me, I was going, oh god, oh god, oh god. <laughs> but I couldn't show that because I'm Dr. Cannett and I've already done this all before. So, <laughs> so that's. That gets me the Emmy. No, yeah. it is. Yeah. So, so this, yeah, for your consideration. Yeah. But um, it, it was a, so that autopsy scene was great. That's, I think, coming up in, a, in, in an episode early on. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I saw the first two episodes, and oh, yeah. like I told um, the producers and Kate, uh, Kristen, yeah. after the second episode, I was like, I need more. Good. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. It's a good sign. It's it good is. Sign. It's really, it's very compelling. Yeah, great. Thank goodness for that. You don't want to go, oh, I've had enough. That's it. Yeah. 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 I'm difficult. Well, everything sounds better with a British accent. Well, good. Well, that's fine. Good. I mean, uh, maybe I'll change it up. I'll change it up next next uh, season. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Did you research any films like Contagion or Outbreak yeah, or anything I like mean, that too? I saw. I saw. I mean, I watched Contagion before. I seen Outbreak before, and, and they're movies that get to develop it in within the ninety minutes, hundred twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but in a show, what I love about the show is that you get to develop it through a story, you get to develop each side, each character, and, and explore these different scenarios and, and that you might not have the luxury with in a, in a movie, in a multi-minute movie. Um, you, uh, you also get more outtakes as well, which is fun. But um, 
So, so yes. Yeah, so, uh, I like. I also saw the um, the Belgian series that is based on Corden. Uh, I saw the first and last episode. I book my, I bookended it. Oh. I don't know if that's a term, but now it is. And um, you say it with confidence. It's okay. I bookended it. So, uh, so just to see, sort of, just a quick, sort of, how it was going. Because I didn't want to watch the whole thing. I didn't want to get influenced by it too much because our characters are very different from that series, and we go off on different tangents from the series as well, which is a great series. Your character, Dr. Lomers, uh, has come to Atlanta. There's a there's a possible contagion outbreak. Can you tell us what you did to prepare for this role, and what drew you to the role? What drew me to the role was Julie Pleck, because I was already working for her on the originals. Um, and in pilot season, word gets around that there are certain pilots that are like. Excuse me, the gold ticket to the Wonka factory. And Corden, as it was named at the time, was one of those. Two or three. One of two or three. And it was extraordinary because my management team called and said, Oh my gosh, Julie Plex got this amazing pilot. It's hers. Everyone's talking about it. You have got to get in and see her. And sometimes it's hard to even get in the room to get an audition. And if you really believe in something, you can self tape, or if you're out of town, you can self tape. And I just happened to be working for her, and we hadn't met yet. And I didn't realize that she'd seen my work, you know, some dailies already, and was really enjoying what I was doing for her on the originals. And she said, absolutely bring her in. So they snuck me in just before my flight to go back to Atlanta to keep shooting on the originals. And I get attached to their version. And I just had this feeling that I was going to be doing it. So I just stopped and I thought, okay. And I had, I was like, the, the lady who plays Sabine in the original series is very different to me, but I could see the qualities that they would be probably looking for in the American versions, and I knew that was something in my wheelhouse, uh, that cold, hard matriarch, um, and I, uh, it was an amazing time because they couldn't fly me back to do the screen test that all the other actors were doing together, so I think most of them met on the same day in the screen test. I was in Atlanta and I was on set shooting a night shoot on the originals and they cancelled the next day of shooting, declared a state of emergency, they were expecting huge snow to come into Atlanta. And so even though I had the day off in order to do something for them in Atlanta and David Nutter, our director, was there at the time, I had to make own way in a car to meet him in what was declared as a state of emergency. And they were saying on the radio, pack your bags for like overnight or two nights just in case you drive somewhere and get stuck, have some food with you, what have you. So I go to see David Nutter and they said, so we're going to tape you with David Nutter as if that's your screen test because at least you'll be working with the director and you would be working with someone like that at the screen test. Mm -hmm. So he just taped me again and he was super sweet and it was this really... I was in this really privileged position of having this special time with David and we walked out of the studio where we ended up filming the series and the snow started to come down and I said, oh, I wanted to get some supplies before we might get snowed in for the weekend. He said, I suggest you go very quickly and do that and then we had home. <laughs> so the timing of it was so extraordinary. Now, was the character written as an American and instead of using your beautiful Australian accent? Thank you. They were open to it. It's just that when they cast George Young, they thought there were too many Commonwealth accents already, so I had to do the US dialect. I'm being uh, given the wrap up seat. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Character Teresa on the show is uh, a teen that's pregnant. Exactly. Um, you and your boyfriend are separated by the cordon after everything is done, but now you're in a panic because you may or may not be infected. What was your mindset in trying to play the panic and also being a pregnant teen? I think that's like one of the interesting parts is that, yeah, there is this disease outbreak going on and that is like terrifying in itself for anybody, let alone someone who is like on the verge of giving birth to her first baby at a very young age without her partner. Um, so it was, you know, thinking about all those things, it was like, how, like, how would you do this? How would you um, kind of keep yourself calm? Because she does, she needs to keep herself calm and think rationally and um, 
ultimately her main goal is to protect this, you know, her baby inside her. Um, yeah. I don't, so, what did you? How did you prepare for the role? And, and number one, obviously, becoming a teen. I just teen. ate a lot. I ate a lot. No, sure. it's, not, it's not prosthetic. It's just eating. <laughs> did you do anything to prepare? Did you talk to to any young mothers, so expectant my, mothers? It was fantastic. As a not fantastic, but um, my sister is a bit older than me. Um, she was um, pregnant during the pilot, and then gave birth. Um, just after, after. So when I was going into the series, she had already given birth, and so I would just I would speak to her. And um, I've actually I'm from a bit of a kind of hippie family, so I've seen like my stepmom like in labor, and you know, so I kind of I know like what like the pain is like not in labor, but like throughout the process um, of having a baby. So I've seen all that, and yeah, and, I, I knew. Yeah. Had some good sources, like good research sources. Yes. Had the script? Did you want to read for any other part besides yours? No. I wanted to. I wanted to play a pregnant person. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was always gonna. I read the script. I wanted to read more. That's what I wanted. Um, I loved that it already had this kind of outline from the Belgian series. You know, it's gonna be strong. It was popular there. Um, I, yeah, I felt, like, I loved Teresa as a character, I loved, like, how um, innocent and, like, gentle, but then you kind of get to see the strength, and, you know, she has to be strong to survive, her, like, to try and, like, bring her baby through it, and, and herself as well, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite that you filmed that you can tell us about? One that I can tell you about. I do have a I liked the, which you would have seen, the, the riot scene. Um, and we see lots of flashes of it so far where yeah. I'm screaming and um, Kristen plays Katie is screaming. That is just was incredible to be a part of because they shut down um, like a street, like a, a major street in Atlanta, and put containers in there and shipping containers and um, you know small like rubbish everywhere and like had like national guard and that was just it was such quick shooting and it made it just so like I get knocked over and I scream. And, like, I love that sort of stuff. I want to be in action. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, so I've seen the first two episodes of the show. So um, obviously there's some uh, issues going on with your relationship with Lex. They do get some resolution, but unfortunately you are separated now. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about uh, when you read the script, what drew you to the role of Jana? I love her strength uh, and her vulnerability. And her vulnerability that she's not even aware that she has or that she doesn't like to give into. Um, and I just find that complexity so human, you know, and something we all relate to. And, and I wanted to tell that story. Did you do anything to prepare for your role as far as like what your character does for a job? Well, I read about data recovery because I'm not anywhere nearly capable of doing anything like that. I mean, I can hardly, I can't, charging my computers, no, I mean, I know more than that, but yeah, not, so I, I wanted to know more about that and what that would actually entail, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, in terms of, I mean, hacking, no, I didn't like, learn how to do that because I did not know. And it's not, it's integral, but it's not, it's more the relationships and her arc opening and becoming a, a leader, so to speak. That's mm -hmm. really what's more important. But yeah, she is instrumental in helping other people track down the virus or, you know, the ins and outs of what may or may not be happening on the outside. Mm -hmm. So what, um, were you part of the riot scene that, that you see in uh, the flashback of part of the 13th, when it goes oh, no. to day 13? Jenna does not go outside unless she absolutely has to. And they can see, because they're up top, so they can see that it's happening. And she's like, no. Any, anytime someone tries to leave a building, she's like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> 
How are you doing? Doing good. I'm here. Yeah, good. So your character Leo yeah. is a disgraced journalist yes. who now has run is running a blog yeah. through this whole epidemic. Can you tell us the evolution of your character? Well, I would say the evolution is uh, is really like you, as you say when we discover him, uh, his reputation has been uh, damaged, uh, and he's trying to claw his way back up uh, into the mainstream and popularity. And this story is. Feels his golden ticket to, to get that, um, and he just first thing he does is befriend Lex to try to get on the inside, get some information, and, and have a um, have a uh, colleague, uh, and and he also has some people on the inside, some some friends collecting information, and as the onion, the layers of onion peeled away, uh, obviously problems arise, things that he didn't expect. Come up uh, information that he didn't see, uh, see that didn't foresee uh, is made available to him, and, and so it gets hairy. And he's also the more he digs, the more danger he becomes. In the more danger he becomes, so um, it's uh, it's quite a journey for him personally. I think Leo is a little bit. Wouldn't you yeah, say? Yeah. Because well, you've seen some of the... Uh... I saw the first two episodes. Okay. So okay. Leo is very kind when Lex is, you know, giving a speech to someone so he can use that as kind of like a, a good cop tries to take down a bad cop. But yeah. as soon as Lex turns against him, you bash him immediately. So the duplicity of your character, how... how how did you get into the mindset of wanting to play? Oh, that? I love those kind of. Those are the best kind of characters. I, mean, I love any character that you can't say is good or bad. Uh, I love it when it's a mixture. When, when, because that's it. Most people are. Yeah. You know, um, the most interesting people are the ones that that uh, are unpredictable. And Leo was unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, so I, I didn't have to do anything. I mean, it's just it was so well written and it's such a part. I didn't have to get in any mindset. You just have to go and go and just play. How fun was it to play? Oh, it was great. Yeah. It's a great, as I say, it's a bit of an anti-hero part, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, and you don't know whether to like him, which I love. I'm not, I'm not sure that... Uh, be a likable character. So will we see and I'm always like, that's the only kind of character that I'm in. Will we see more of his backstory of why he was disgraced? I hope so. In season one? Oh, in season one. Um, no. I, well, no. I don't Not too much? No? I don't know how much I'm supposed to say. Okay. So containment is fantastic. I saw the first two episodes. Oh, thank you. I couldn't. I was so upset that I couldn't have more episodes to watch and devour. They were so good. Um, in in creating the show, or, or not creating it, but uh, doing the show uh, and writing for it too. What drew you to wanting to do this type of series when you come from the supernatural world? So. <laughs> I think it was the fact that it was not supernatural, but still had a very clear monster. You know, um, I love writing character stories, and, and in this television climate, it's easier and, and often more successful when you, you know, you can tell a beautiful love story with a monster looming large. And what I was saying to the other uh, cast and the, uh, the producers was that um, you start to immediately care about the characters, even in the first episode, which is not easy to do, and the way they're written and the way that they these actors play their characters, it's so organic and fluid that you feel like you're just kind of like a fly on the wall watching them go through this ordeal, yes. because they really, it, the writing is fantastic, and I really love the organic way that the characters have been developed over the, even just the two episodes that I watched. Well, I'll tell you, you can thank the Belgian series for that. Um, you know, I think in an ensemble show that is based around an event, you know, the hardest thing to do 
is to capture that slice of life, the slice of life of the characters, in a way that doesn't seem like you're forcing anything, pushing too hard, trying to be too kitschy or too fippy, or you know, like you know, but you've got like half a page to a page and a half to define who they are in in, in, in the first act of your pilot. Um, and the belt series did a really great job. So I lifted a lot of what they did <laughs> right from the top because I found it so successful, and it was it was successful in its simplicity and how sparse it was and they didn't they didn't put forth much effort um, in feeling like they had to explain too much about these people and that's what I liked about it you got like a little peek through the window of who they were and then it's up to the the season to let you flesh them out you know and um, and so you kind of inherently care about them from the beginning because they, in a weird way they're a little bit like a piece of all of us which I liked um, I do, you know, I like to write for all of them. I think that, I think that Leo is probably a favorite because he's so unpredictable. Um, and Trevor is really talented, like deeply, deeply talented and very trained as an actor. And so you know anything you put in his mouth, he's going to do really well. But he's just, he's got such a chip on his shoulder and he's just got, he's got a really wicked sense of humor and he's so annoyed by everything. And, and it just has no tolerance for any bullshit, and and it's just a guy that wants the truth that doesn't really care who he offends along the way. And I always think, what it must be like to be that person, you know, um, who's just like, uh, uh-uh, you don't like me, that's your problem, you know. And I love that about him. So you said that uh, you know you really liked writing for this because it's, it's a monster, but it's not a monster. Yeah. You know? um, so you know it's kind of hard to sell a disease show to the average kind of yes. popcorn viewer. The, the WonderCon, you know, <laughs> consumer. Yes. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I, I'm kind of interested in you know how this idea of like a monster is not a monster affected your writing process. You know, as someone who hasn't seen the show yet, and most all of my readers haven't seen the show yet. You know, how does that? Influence what kind of character drama you're creating, and also the world that you're making. Well, you know what's funny is my background. I, you know, my one of my first jobs is over for Wes Craven, mm-hmm. and Wes was really, really good visually setting the tone for suspense and scare. And there's a bag of tricks that you know that work really nicely. You know, has to do with the way you creep up behind someone on a steady cam, or the way that you draw them into the room it's how you see a big space where there's nothing and then you cut then you cut back and there's someone right in front of you and there's a a visual rhythm and a language to doing good horror and good suspense that I kind of got to watch him do it and of course Kevin Williamson who I worked with for years made his whole career out of of the the scare and and tension and how to make you terrified of the masked figure in you know in the shadows and so to me this was using exactly the same tools you know the monster is under your bed in the show all the time you know it's in the person that you might touch it's in the door that you might open and who's on the other side it's you know someone could leap out at you from an alley grab you and you're dead you know and I think that in that way it's actually so simple uh, as a suspense vehicle Um, and then you add on the kind of cool side of it cool relatively speaking and then it could actually happen so you get to play in that great world of horror and genre, um, and the Freddy Krueger and the Jason and the Michael, you know, and you and you get to use all those fun tricks, but you're also delivering this like weird, fucked up wish fulfillment of what would happen and what would I do in this situation, and how would I be the cowboy and survive the killer. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's fun to write it like that. It really is. And you know, we had rules that every episode needed to have the three H's: um, heart, horror, and holy shit. You know, um, the holy shit being like, what's the surprise or what's the big wow or whatever. But horror, we made sure that we we treated that with as much respect as we did the humanity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.